Today, I'm going to summarize or explain every major thing that happens in the story after the anime of Hoseki no Kuni or Land of the Lustrous. Why? Why am I doing this? Well, as someone who is a massive fan of the anime, I put off reading the manga for literally six years, so I figured if I put it off for this long, other people may have done the same. So while this video isn't a complete replacement for the manga, I just have to share what happens for the anime onlys, or if you just want to recap or whatever, just do, just do you. Quick disclaimers, um... There's going to be spoilers, I, I hope you realize that. That is the point of this video. And additionally, I won't really talk too much about the supporting cast and more of the emotional stuff. This is mainly about the big events of the plot. I really won't do the manga justice here, so you should really read it yourself. And with that out of the way, we can get right in there. Where do episodes 11 and 12 leave us off? The Lunarian Beast thing had just attacked the school and Fos begins developing their suspicions of Sensei. And as the audience, we see Pad Paracha revive for the first time and give Fos some helpful advice. Stay calm and carry things out carefully. This advice is very important. Now that's where the anime officially stops. Now one of the very first things we discover that goes into the manga is the fact that Sensei is potentially a gem. He's not human, that's for sure. During a fight with one of the newer looking Lunarians, Ghost gets into a bit of danger. We see Sensei in a moment of desperation use his power to save them. What he does is he breaks off a piece of himself and chucks it like a projectile and instantly destroys the Lunarian ship. This shows how Sensei was always able to just one-shot the Lunarians whenever he got there, and that he's definitely not human, probably some kind of mineral or gem. A little bit after that, Ghost and Foss pair up. Ghost being a character that hadn't really shown up much at all during the anime, but they are this double structured gem that essentially has an outer and an inner layer, each one of these layers having its own personality. So it's like a two in one. Right around here, the era of evolving Lunarian technology and tactics begins. They aren't messing around anymore, they're coming and they're hitting hard. And at the same time, Foss is still trying to communicate with the Lunarians. Foss's carelessness eventually leads to Ghost, their outer layer, being taken away. This is a pretty big blunder and the inner layer of Ghost is not happy with this at all. With that happening, Foss decides to chill out on their conviction to uncover the truth because it caused the loss of Ghost. And eventually, Sensei decides to rename the inner layer of Ghost to Cairngorm, who I will be referring to as CG for the rest of this video just for the sake of easiness. And the Lunarians continue attacking in newer and deadlier ways. There's times where they use these little board pieces that take tiny fragments off the gems, they use smoke screens, some kind of material that prevents Foss from using their alloy. These attacks get more and more deadly and eventually result in Foss losing their head. Now this is a big deal. With Foss having lost their head, they obviously need to find a replacement. CG and Ghost were the former partners of another gem that was abducted named Lapis, the only thing remaining of them being their head. So CG consents to allowing Rutile to use Lapis's head and putting it on Foss to revive them. Now this has some pretty serious side effects for Foss because Lapis was a very intelligent but also very scheming and calculating gem. And much like Foss, they also had their suspicions of Sensei and was looking to uncover the truth. So once Foss had the new head of Lapis placed onto them, they ended up sleeping for 200 years before waking up. The tipping point. The Lunarians end up dropping this humanoid statue thingy, and Sensei, upon seeing this statue, exclaims, Professor, and immediately orders Foss to cut it down. Foss's curiosity then reaches a peak and they throw away all their caution and patience and directly question Sensei. What is this thing? What the hell? Who's the professor? What's going on here? And all of Sensei's answers are, um, I don't, I don't know, I really can't really say, um, I don't know, just trust me, I love you, alright? I just can't tell you. Foss is obviously not too impressed with these answers, but they do find some answers from a sea slug princess, much like the one we saw in the anime. The slug princess tells Foss about the evolution of humans on the planet and how humans split into three parts, bones, flesh, and spirit. The Lunarians being the spirit, the gems being the bone, and the slugs being the flesh. And shortly after this conversation with the slug princess, Foss decides that they will go to the moon. They try to convince Cinnabar to go to the moon with them, offering this as their one and only job for them. But to no luck. Cinnabar thinking that this is way too extreme of a step to take. And honestly, they would just be happy if Foss agreed to just be their partner. Anyway, on Foss and CG's next encounter with the Lunarians, they have Foss kind of play dead 
and they get sent off to the moon. Arrival on the moon. Foss begins fighting their way through the surrounding Lunarians once they land, and almost immediately we see this massive base that looks like it came straight out of a modern art museum. Foss then encounters a particular Lunarian who seems to have some authority around the place, and this Lunarian explains everything. I forgot to mention this in my original script, but the Lunarians refuse to talk on Earth, mainly just because of the atmosphere, and they just don't like to breathe the air on Earth. But they're actually perfectly fine speaking on the moon. Just before the end of human civilization, it became known that human spirits exist. In order for these spirits to pass to the afterlife, they must be purified. In order for the spirits to be purified, they had to receive prayer from living humans, but obviously the humans were about to die out. In order to solve the problem of there being no one to purify the spirits, the last remaining humans created a machine in order to pray in their place. However, this machine eventually ceased operations, and for tens of thousands of years it has not been functioning. The unpurified spirits had essentially been left stranded in purgatory on the moon. In other words, the present day Lunarians. That machine being Sensei. He is the hardest mineral on Earth, and his real name is Adamant. Sensei, the machine crafted by the humans in order to pray for the unpurified souls seemed to stop working around the time when he started assembling his family of gem children. Now, tens of thousands of years is a very long time, and the Lunarians tried just about everything to get Sensei to start praying for them. They tried being nice about it, and that didn't work. So naturally, they started doing things the hard way. Abducting Sensei's gem children, grinding them up, sprinkling their gem dust all over the moon so that every night when Sensei would look up at the sky, he would see his precious family that was taken away from him. This is why the Lunarians do what they do, and why they appeared as the enemy thus far in the series. They are simply doing what they can in order to pass on. They don't actually die, they just respawn on the moon when their bodies get destroyed. Additionally, they developed highly advanced technology with their time on the moon. They have scientific facilities that can do all kinds of things, including crafting artificial gems. So they are far more technologically advanced compared to Retiel back on Earth. Now this is a lot of information, and comes as a bit of a shock to Foss, who does take all of it in. And eventually they set up a plan where they're going to betray Sensei. They were going to do this by partnering up with this Lunarian Prince and bringing more gems with them to the moon. Foss returns to Earth and everyone is overjoyed at Foss's return. Sensei says he's happy that Foss is back, but doesn't care to question what happened to them on the moon, much to the surprise of Foss. They're thinking like, what, you, you don't even care? Like, I was talking with the enemy and you don't even care about that, really? And Sensei's like, nope, I'm, nope, I'm good. Foss begins slowly and calmly carrying out their plan over the following month. And that plan is to drip feed information to the rest of the gems to entice them to join them on a trip to the moon. All in an effort to stir this feeling of betrayal in Sensei, which will hopefully stir him to start praying again. Foss assembles a team that willingly comes with them to the moon, consisting of Amethyst 84, Diamond, Yellow Diamond, Cairngorm, Goshenite, Benitoite, and Alexandrite, as well as the Sleeping Beauty, Pad Parasha. Needless to say, the remaining two-thirds of the gems back on Earth are not too thrilled about the squad leaving for the moon. Especially Rutile. Especially Rutile. In order to clear things up, Adamant, Sensei, explains his identity and the origins of the gem school to the remaining gems back on Earth. And all of them have a big communion together and get to know Adamant as an equal rather than as their mentor. Life back on the moon. The gem squad on the moon begins to get more accustomed to life over there. And the prince actually informs CG that they are being controlled by the fragments of Ghost left in their eyes. Ghost always thought favorably towards Foss, so that is why CG has been reluctantly helping them. They've literally been controlled like a puppet. So the prince offers to replace CG's eyes so that they could have their own freedom. They take him up on that offer, and this results in probably the most jarring change in personality in the whole series. Seriously, like, like, who are you? Foss then sets up another plan to return to Earth, this time to physically force Adamant to pray. Together with Pad Paradsha and Yellow, the three begin their assault. The first conflict. When the three land back on Earth, they are met with almost instant hostility, this marking the first event of serious gem-on-gem -gem violence in the series. To everyone's surprise, Pad Pad Paradsha begins mercilessly chopping people down like a true savage, even Rutile. Bort immediately confronts Foss with a flurry of attacks, and shortly after, even Cinnabar attacks Foss using their long-range mercury poison to incapacitate them. The three of them are left defeated with no sight of adamant. But luckily, CG swoops in on a Lunarian ship and rescues the three of them by 
taking them back to the moon. Back to the moon once again. Foss begins seriously questioning their position in the story. The gems on Earth see them as a Lunarian, and the Lunarians see them as a gem. After getting attacked by Cinnabar, someone who they always thought of as a close ally, Foss's mental state begins to heavily waver. At their wit's end, Foss decides that they will return to Earth alone once more. This time, they want to try asking Adamant to pray, unarmed and in a peaceful way. At the same time, all the other gems seem to be having a pretty great time on the moon. There's even a huge wedding held to celebrate the marriage of CG and the prince. Foss seems to be the only one affected by the whole Earth situation. Back to the Earth once again. Foss sets out to the Earth solo, the plan this time to approach the gems peacefully and ask Adamant to pray for the Lunarians. Upon arrival, Bort attacks and cuts down Foss immediately and they lock him up. Foss requests to speak with Adamant and the gems allow it. It is here where Foss makes their first attempt at making Adamant pray. Adamant begins going through the motions and some magical lights start going off, but after a little bit, he stops and says that he has a fatal defect and something is stopping him from completing the task. In shock, Foss reaches for Adamant, but all the other gems interpret this as an attack, so they all quickly shatter Foss into many small pieces. They then scatter all of these pieces all over the land so that they can't regenerate using that metal alloy. 220 years pass by, and we see that Adamant by himself has been slowly piecing together Foss. It seems he waited 220 years so that the other gems would forget about them and he could repair them in secret. In their fragmented state, Foss requests Adamant pray again, this time not for the Lunarians, but for them specifically. Foss saying that they no longer have the will to go on and that they just want to be prayed out of existence. Adamant attempts to pray again unsuccessfully, but in a rage, Foss forcefully puts his hands together and forces him to pray. This attempt appears to be more successful than the last time. However, it gets interrupted by the gems who awake from their winter hibernation. Foss desperately runs from the school, but the gems relentlessly pursue her, many of them violently attempting to hunt him down. Very suddenly, a Lunarian ship arrives and down comes Pod Paradsha, who offers themselves up, saying they can use the artificial gems in their body as a reference. This interaction serving as a distraction for a Lunarian assistant as well as Ghosh to bring Foss onto the ship and back to the moon. Back to the moon, once again, times two. Foss is broken. Not just physically, but emotionally, mentally, they've gone off the deep end. And so, Foss comes up with another plan. They will return to Earth, force Adamant to pray, and brutally destroy every gem. To accomplish this, Foss begins recruiting as many gems from the Moon Squad as possible. Together with Diamond, Alex, and Benito, the four of them return to Earth with an army. The final battle. Foss pulls up on Earth with the full wrath of the Lunarians. Just keep in mind that this is what they were capable of this whole time. Crazy. The battle begins with Diamond facing off with Bort, a rivalry spanning the entire series. The two of them cut each other down. Alex goes berserk and begins crushing several gems and herself along with Benito. And finally, Foss is the only moon gem that remains so she enters the school and begins executing the remaining gems. The 1v1 with Cinnabar. These two characters begin firing off their long-range attacks in a brutal clash of Foss's mineral alloy and Cinnabar's poison. It's a close battle, but Foss's alloy resists the effects of the poison and they defeat Cinnabar. And on a side note, this battle is actually really tragic and I just want to talk about it real quick. When Cinnabar is defeated, they thank Foss. Throughout most of the early parts of the series, Foss and Cinnabar had this awkward relationship. Foss promised that one day they would find a job that even Cinnabar, the exiled and isolated gem, could do. The two of them kind of had this distance from the others in common. And now, by Foss unintentionally making themselves the enemy, it allowed Cinnabar to form a strong connection with the other gems, ending their isolation. And they finally found a place in the family. So this moment here is them acknowledging that Foss kept their promise even if it was in the most tragic way possible. All the gems Earthside are now broken and Foss continues walking through the school until they reach Adamant. And upon reaching him, Foss tells him to break. Adamant smiles and then crumbles into pieces. Explanation. So what's going on here is really interesting. The prince from the moon actually explains why this works this way. It's because Foss essentially became human. Each one of their evolutions all led to this point. Their body consists of parts from all three descendants of humans, making them the closest thing to an actual human being. In addition, with the head of Lapis being attached, it increased their intelligence. A clever mind is dangerous, he says. A lot of the physical and mental evolution that happened to Foss throughout the story were apparently according to the prince's plan. Also, he could make the perfect human. And surprise, surprise, 
Adamant being a machine crafted by humans can only respond to commands given by humans. That is why he crumbles when Foss commands him to. On Earth, the prince forces Foss to take the right eye of Adamant, and he leaves the planet with all the fragments of the other gems. He purposely leaves behind Foss. Now that Foss has taken the right eye of Adamant, they essentially become the next prayer machine. The perfect candidate for it as well. Someone who has lost everything, friends, family, and wishes for the end of existence for everything. They now have the mindset that Adamant could not have. It takes 10,000 years for Foss to acquire those powers though. And meanwhile, back on the moon, Amethyst 84 along with the Lunarian scientists develop a machine that can turn gems into Lunarians. So. All the gems become Lunarians, 10,000 years pass by, and Foss, becoming the new prayer machine, prays for everyone and they all move on, leaving them all alone at the end of time. Now this is about at chapter 100 and it's where I'm going to stop my recap. The story is still ongoing, but I want to stop my summary here and I gotta reiterate, my video here should not be a replacement for the manga. There are actually some really powerful moments that take place in this story between some of the other supporting characters that I didn't get to dive into as much, but nonetheless they are there. So I strongly recommend to read Hoseki no Kuni if you haven't already. Of course, let me know what you think down below in the comments. Should I keep making these recap style videos? Not gonna lie, this was a beast to make. This, this took a long time to make. But anyway, that's all from me. Have a beautiful day, and I'll see y'all later.